Thank you. Okie dokie. This concerns um, Romano British figural funerary reliefs, which are simply funerary reliefs that have bodies on them. That's what I'm currently looking at. And I'm going to be thinking about whether we can have a transition if we're unsure of what the transition is to, and also unsure of the chronology with which we um, see that transition. So, tombstone reliefs depicting bodies that survive from Roman Britain represent the production of a whole new visual culture following cultural contact. There was no tradition of stone figural commemorative sculpture in Britain before the Romans. This initial transition from not having um, a transition from a uh, tradition rather of stone figural commemorative imagery to having one occurred relatively quickly after the conquest and settlement of Britain by the Romans. The relationship between this cultural content that created them and the appearance of these tombstones has been the focus of a great deal of study. Scholarship has shifted, though, from explaining the appearance of these images by saying that they look this way because of the cultural contact that created them, to trying to reassess the nature of that cultural contact by examining the images themselves. Style is inextricably linked to these arguments, with hybridity, or romanization, or creolization, being debated both in terms of how it looks and how we can explain or interpret it. But many discussions of this material seem to have implicit in them the notion of a second, more elusive transition. This implied transition is one that has the earliest reliefs as somehow less hybrid, and the later ones moving in the direction of a genuinely hybrid Romano-British style as cultural contact continued. On its surface, this might make sense, but I think it's actually rather more of an issue than that. In this paper, I plan to question the idea of this second stylistic transition on two main grounds, chronology and also the very idea of Romano-British style at all. So, how have these figural funerary reliefs been dated? Of 75 of the images I've looked at have been dated as follows. Four by their clothing, uh, four by epigraphic factors such as lettering style, five by legionary information present in inscriptions, five by archaeological context, 16 by style, 19 by the hairstyles of figures, particularly of women, and a further 16 had no dating criteria in catalogues at all, but were simply given a date, which leads me to think that many of these were also dated by style or general impression. To demonstrate just how problematic much of our chronology for these reliefs is, I will now go through a couple of examples in detail. We begin in York with two tombstones dedicated to women, one to Julia Velva on the left and one to Ailia Aileana. These are both dated according to the similarity of female hairstyles to that of Julia Domna, the wife of Septimius Severus, who was emperor from 193 to 211 AD. Despite being dated by this same comparison, and being covered in the same catalogue, just one page apart, they're given different dates, one well into the 3rd century, the other to the late 2nd or early 3rd century. The following quotation is from the dating section of the catalogue entry for the first one, the tombstone of Julia Velda. The main elements for dating the monument are the portraits rather than the inscription. The 3rd century seems likely, perhaps sometime rather well into it. In fact, the female hairstyles seem to reflect Julia Domna's, and the presence of Septimius Severus's court at York until 211 must have left behind it traces and influences for some time. Mercurialis's beard and hairstyle recall those of slightly later emperors, Gordian I and Balbinus. While, as you can see, there are no glaring contrasts between the images of Julia Velva and her daughter and Julia Domna, the assumption on which this dating rests is extremely problematic. Not only does it assume that female hairstyle is a more reliable dating criterion than male, which itself is not necessarily true, but it also makes assumptions regarding the influence of the imperial court at York. Firstly, the existence of that influence at all, and secondly, the time with which that influence would take to catch on. To date this stone well into the 3rd century allows for a significant time lag between the presence of the court and the creation of this stone which is not afforded to the next image, that of Ailea Aileana. As before, her hairstyle could be seen as similar to Julia Domna's. But after engaging in a bit of spot the imperial hairstyle myself, <laughs> I, I discovered that actually, if anything, she has the hair of Articulia Sever Severiana or Tranquilina, who were the wives of 
Gordon III and Philip the Arab, dated from about 238 to 249, which would move the date of the stone into at least the mid-3rd century, much later if we give them the same kind of time lag that was afforded to Julia Velva. And if we buy that female imperial hairstyle is a reliable dating criterion for tombstones in Yorkshire. With such issues as inconsistencies of dating within reliefs between male and female hairstyle, for example, uncertainty as to what imperial style we can actually see, and the near impossibility of estimating an appropriate length of time to allow for imperial influence to reach the provinces, I think it's pretty clear that dating by hairstyle can barely get us to a date within a given century, never mind any more specific than that. And if we can assume that both of these stones can be dated to some time within the third century, we need to engage with a whole new set of problems. The art history of the provinces, particularly looking at sculpture, has developed a great deal in recent years, but something we still fail to do adequately, I think, is to incorporate provincial material into the art history of later antiquity. The imperial portraiture of the third century, for example, is full of complex stylistic references back to various periods of Roman art history, combined often with stylistic innovation that fails to map on to a clear linear sequence. Quick turnovers of rulers and the resultant constant and significant shifts in imperial image make dating anything, never mind provincial commemorative sculpture, on the basis of third century imperial portraiture, highly misguided. Oh no, sorry. Dating by style more generally brings with it this same problem. Roman art of the second and third centuries is often seen as transitional, as moving towards the art of late antiquity. But it doesn't do this smoothly. And if the art of this period tells us anything, it's that style is ultimately a choice, governed by decisions that rely on more than just time and linear sequence. To demonstrate this idea further, these two tombstones are both dated, reasonably reliably, for this material, by reference to legions in the epitaphs below the reliefs, to the mid to late first century, and they're both from Sirencester. In fact, they were found just a few metres apart from each other, about 90 metres south of the south gate. They are both examples of the rider and foe type, which has its origins in the Balkans and came to Britain with the Roman army via the Rhine frontier. Despite all this, they look very different from one another. Is this down to the skill of the craftsman, or genuine preference for an alternative style? Either way, these disparately styled images existed in the same place at the same time and should thus caution us from the use of style to date any reliefs. This short look at a few images has shown that we cannot afford to rely on the dating methods we currently have for Romano British figural funerary reliefs. Dates are often vague, and of those which are dated at all, most are dated to the 3rd century, as we can see, or sometime between the 2nd and 3rd century. If we were to accept all the dates for these images, therefore, we would be left with a picture that's so vague and a spread of images that's so monolithic as to make any attempt at dem demonstrating a transition almost impossible and of limited use anyway. Having questioned chronology and found it wanting, we can now interrogate style itself, more specifically the idea of Romano-British style towards which this putative transition was going. The first question here, for me anyway, is what's Roman in all of this? Perhaps the earliest figural tombstone relief from Roman Britain is this one from Colchester of Marcus Favonius Faculus. The style's been described as eclectic, with comparanda from Hellenistic Greek art, such as the Hermes in the middle, to um, more local examples, such as this head of Claudius from London. Possibly. Um, the eclectic style, as well as the perceived superior quality, has been seen as evidence of the craftsman's connection to Mediterranean culture. Is this, therefore, our most Roman image from Roman Britain to, in tombstones? One that's hardly Roman, really, at all. What about the numerous examples of rider and foe reliefs that I've already mentioned a couple of? These came to Britain by way of the Roman army, but are arguably hybrid themselves. Many have an early date, but are these any less hybrid than later images? Can we think of them as Roman, never mind Roman or British? Another type of relief to com have come through this route to Britain is the Totenmal or funerary banquet scene. These types arguably develop their own distinct styles in Britain, but such shifts in appearance are rarely consistent. Even within settlements, as we saw in the case of the Sirencester riders, and again in these two examples from Chester on either side, there can be significant differences both within types and within settlements 
just as between those things. Seeing or seeking a Romano-British style involves attempting the difficult, if not impossible, task of unpicking the individual Roman or British or other elements in each image to reveal exactly what each looks like in order to get a broader picture of what Romano-British hybridity might look like. Difficulties here arise, in addition to those with chronology, in that none of these categories exist in a co consistent or cohesive way, thus leaving us with lots of disparate elements and instances of hybridity which we are unable to meaningfully unpack in terms of motivations or negotiations in many cases. But there is another angle available to us with which to look at these images, which is to think of style not as a dating feature, but rather as a series of choices, making hybridity not just a reflection of culture, but an active element in fulfilling artistic intention. Looking at the tombstone of Regina from South Shields in the northeast, just the one on the far left, um, the interaction between Palmyrene style, Latin and Palmyrene inscriptions, and a British tribal name and clothing make for a particularly effective monument in commemorating both her husband and commemorator, as well as her own origins. The other two examples are on the surface very different. The one in the middle seems to, broad seems to broadcast Romanness through a military connection, whilst the one closest to me is other and difficult to categorise and has often been viewed as artistically inferior. But alongside Regina, these two images are in fact examples of the extensive use of linear patterning in Romano-British funerary art. This feature in the past has been seen as either a native Celtic feature or a universal characteristic of naive art. But I think instead that it's an element used across styles to affect in a particular way in a commemorative context. I believe that it helps to communicate visually the difficulty of representing someone who's no longer here, but whose presence is called forth by an image. These bodies are simultaneously drawing our attention through their patterning and being obscured by it as a result of this focus on surface that it creates. They are simultaneously present and frustratingly absent. Thus, an element of Romano-British funerary reliefs that otherwise becomes embroiled in debates about skill and cultural contact can allow, when seen from another angle, for reliefs that appear wildly different to be reconciled as part of the same visual culture. An examination of chronology and style in these images has revealed the instability of our knowledge and understanding of this material. The idea of a stylistic transition has been shown to be difficult to see if it existed at all, and I've tried to suggest that style can be more fruitfully examined for its effect in a given context than as a dating criterion. This suggestion, though, is just one possibility, but it does allow us to move beyond often unanswerable and misguided questions of stylistic development, whilst allowing for individual hybridities to be illuminated without the need for an overarching transition or a single hybrid style. <laughs>